The region of the seashore is bounded on one side by the height of extreme high tide and on the other by the height of extreme low tide. Within these confines, conditions change hourly with the ebb and the flow of the tides. During flood tide, the seashore is a water world. During ebb tide, it belongs to the terrestrial environment with its extremes in temperature, moisture, and solar radiation. There are many effects that resulted from these changes, but seashore inhabitants are essentially marine organisms adapted to withstand some degree of exposure to the air for varying periods of time. At ebb tide, the uppermost layers of intertidal life are exposed to air, wide temperature fluctuations, intense solar radiation, and desiccation. The lowest fringes on the intertidal shore may be exposed only briefly before the rising tide submerges them again. This now results in one of the most striking features of the coastal shoreline, the zonation of life. All rocky shores have three basic zones, each characterized by dominant organisms. The approach to a rocky shore from the landward side is marked by a gradual transition from lichens and land plants to marine life dependent, at least partly on the tidal waters. Moving from terrestrial or supralittoral or supratidal zone, the first major change from the adjacent terrestrial environment appears at the supralittoral fringe, where salt water comes only once every two weeks on the spring tides. It is marked by the black zone, named for the thin black layer of cyanobacteria Calothrix growing on the rock together with lichens Verrocarha and green alga Entophysalis above the high tide water line. Below the black zone lies the littoral or intertidal zone, which is covered and uncovered daily by the tides. In the upper reaches, barnacles are most abundant. Occupying the lower half of the littoral zone of colder climates, and in places overlying the barnacles is an ancient group of plants, the brown algae, commonly known as rockweeds, ficus sp, and rock ascophyllium nodosum. The lowest part of the littoral zone, uncovered only at the spring tides and not even then, if wave action is strong, is the infralittoral fringe. This zone, exposed for short periods of time, consists of forests of large brown alga, laminaria, one of the cups with the rich undergrowth of smaller plants and animals among the holdfast. Below the infralittoral fringe is the infralittoral or subtidal zone. Grazing, predation, competition, larval settlement, and action of waves heavily influence the pattern of life on rocky shores. Waves bring in a steady supply of nutrients and carry away organic material. They keep the fronts of seaweeds in constant motion, moving them in and out of shadow and sunlight, allowing more even distribution of incident light and thus more efficient photosynthesis. Heavy wave action can reduce the activity of such predators as starfish and sea urchins that feed on intertidal invertebrates. In effect, disturbance influences community structure. Sandy and muddy shores are often devoid of life during low tides. But the void might not be the right term because life lurks beneath these seemingly barren sandy shores waiting for the next high tide. Sandy shores are products of unforgiving and unrelenting weathering of rock. The rivers and waves carry these weathered rocks to shores and is deposited as sand. These sand particles influence the very nature of the beach it creates, from water retention during the low tide to the types of animals that burrow through it. Life exists in sandy shores as epifauna, which are organisms living on the sediment surface, and infauna, which burrow and live within the sediments. Smaller types of infauna are meofauna, which burrow within sand and range in size from 0.05 to 0.5 millimeters. 
as can be seen here, mayo fauna include copepods, ostracods, and nematodes. Sandy beaches also exhibit zonation. Starting inland and moving towards the shore, the coastline is divided into the supralittoral, littoral, and infralittoral zones. Diverse populations of organisms can be observed throughout the different zones of the sand. Beach hoppers and ghost crabs that are usually the same color as the sand can be found in the upper beach supralittoral zone. But it is in this littoral zone where true marine life is most abundant. This is also known as the intertidal zone where although lacking in variety compared to that found in rocky shores, most of the inhabitants of this zone are burrowing animals. A wide array of animals among them are starfish and sand dollars. The infralittoral zone is usually underwater and are composed of the usual marine inhabitants like mollusks and the usual crustaceans. Now that you have brief knowledge about the life as it exists in the coast, we move on to another type of aquatic habitat, the salt marshes that are found in more temperate climates. Salt marshes occur in temperate regions, protected from wave action within estuaries, barrier islands, dunes, and deltas. Its tropical counterpart, the mangroves, will be discussed later. The tides and salinity dictate the structure of the salt marsh. These factors create a complex marked plant communities. Starting from the sea's edge going inland, distinctive zones of vegetation develop. Deep green growths of cordgrass, Spartina alterniflora, can be found on the seaward edge of these salt marshes, as well as tidal creeks of trees. This cordgrass creates a boundary. The open mud in front of it and the high marsh to the back. This disease in particular has a very high tolerance for salinity and can live in water. Right after the low marsh is the high marsh, right at the level of mean high water. Here, tall salt marsh cordas gives way shorter form, yellowish in color and in contrast to its tall dark green form. This change in phenotype is an example of phenotypic plasticity in response to environmental because there is a sharp contrast between condition marsh. The high marsh has significantly higher salinity and a decreased input of nutrients from a lower tidal exchange rate than in the low marsh, along with more yellowish, shorter cordgrass, fleshy translucent glassworts, sea lavender, spear scale, and sea blight grows in this region of the salt marsh. Although the salt marshes aren't known for its diversity, there's still a few animals that call it home. Some inhabitants are permanent residents of the sand and mud. Others visit seasonally, while still others are transient visitors, only coming to feed at the higher or low tide. The three dominant residents of the marshes are ribbed mussels, fiddler crabs, and marsh periwinkles. The mussels are usually buried halfway in the mud, while the fiddler crabs run across the marsh when the tide is low. The periwinkles move up and down the stems of the cordgrass and onto the mud to feed on alga. As mentioned earlier, salt marshes are replaced by mangroves in more tropical regions of the world. This mangrove forests cover almost 75% of the tropical coast where wave action is absent. The more dominant mangrove genus are the Rhizophora and Avicennia. The Rhizophora are among the better known members of the mangrove trees of the genus Rhizophora. There are around 149 species distributed in 16 genera, most native to the Old World. These are woody plants with opposite or world leaves with insect pollinated flowers having nectary disc and typically five petals. This family is now placed in the order Malficialis. Though under the Cronquist system, they formed an order in themselves. The Avicennia are among the most salt-tolerant mangroves and are often the first to colonize new deposits of sediment. Its sap is salty and excess salt is secreted. It also has a spreading root system that provides stability in shifting substrates. It also has vertical roots called pneumatophores that project from the mud. These are used in change as there is very little oxygen available in the mud. 
The flowers are fragrant and rich in nectar and are pollinated by insects. The embryos exhibit cryptovivipary, a process where they start to develop before the seed is shed but do not break through the outside of the fruit capsule. In growth, mangroves range from short, prostrate forms to timber-sized trees about 30 meters high. All mangroves have shallow, widely spreading roots, and many have roots sprouting from the trunk and limbs, and many species have root extensions that take in oxygen for the roots, called nematophores. This tangle of roots also slow down the movement of tidal waters and allow sediments to settle down. With a unique mix of terrestrial and marine organisms, many species call the mangrove forests home. Some birds, like the heron, take shelter in the upper branches while the litorina, or the periwinkle snails, live on the prop roots and trunks of the mangrove trees, along with oysters and barnacles. On the base of the roots and muddy portions live the detritus feeding snails, while the fiddler crabs and other tropical crabs during low tide and live on the prop roots and high ground during the height. Wetlands cover 6% of the Earth's surface. Part of this are the freshwater wetlands. Unlike estuaries, freshwater wetlands are not connected to the ocean. They can be found along the boundaries of streams, lakes, ponds, or even in large shallow holes that fill up with rainwater. Freshwater wetlands may stay wet all year long, or the water may evaporate during the dry season. Wetlands most commonly occur in tree topographic situations. Basin wetlands develop because of upland depressions to fill in lakes or ponds. The movement of water is mainly vertical due to precipitation and the downward infiltration of water into the soil. Riverine wetlands are wetlands that are present within a river or stream channels and are greatly affected by seasonal runoffs. They provide habitat for water tolerant plants such as the willow and aquatic animals like tadpoles and immature fishes. The movement of water is unidirectional. Fringe wetlands occur along the coast of large lakes. The flow of water in these wetlands are in two directions permitting the exchange of nutrients and sediments into and out of the wetland. Due to wetlands range along a gradient of permanently flooded to periodically saturated soil, they support specialized water-adapted plants, which are called hydrophytic plants or hydrophytes. Hydrophytes are plants that grow in water or on a substrate that is at least periodically deficient in oxygen as a result of excessive water content. At the most basic level, wetland plants are an important component of a wetland system. They are the basis for the food web, the complex and interwoven pathways by which the plant materials are consumed by other organisms. They are mainly grouped into tree. First, the obligate wetland plants, which are found in wetlands almost 99% of the time. Examples include the smooth cordgrass, Spartina altiniflora, a tall smooth grass ranging in height from 6 inches to 7 feet. Its leaves are thick and wide, and the root structure is strong and complex. Another is Taxodium distinctum, or commonly known as the bald cypress. It is a deciduous conifer reaching tw to 25 to 40 meters. The bark is gray-brown to red-brown, shallowly vertically fissured with a stringy texture. Floating pond lilies and emergent cattails and bulrushes are also obligate wetland plants. Second, the facultative wetland plants, which are found in wetlands 67 to 99 percent of the time. These plants include the red ash, a deciduous medium-sized tree reaching 12 to 25 meters. Its bark is smooth and gray on young trees and their leaves are 15 to 30 centimeters long, pinnately compound with 7 to 9 
occasionally 5 or 11 leaflet. Adding to that, the red maple is also a facultative wetland plant. The red maple or Acer rubrium is a medium to large size tree reaching heights of 18 to 27 meters and known to exhibit brilliant deep scarlet leaves during the autumn season. Other examples are the rod osier dogwood and cottonwoods. Lastly, occasional wetland plants which can tolerate the wetland environment even though they are not normally found there. They are important in determining the upper limit of a wetland along a gradient of soil moisture. There are mainly different types of freshwater wetlands, all of which have different names. This can sometimes lead to confusion. These are all names of different types of wetlands. Marsh, bog, fen, swamp, mire, slough, and prairie pothole. These places can look very different, but because they are all areas with wet soil or where water covers the soil, they are considered wetlands. Marshes are defined as wetlands frequently or continually inundated with water, characterized by emergent soft stem vegetation adapted to saturated soil conditions. In marshes, Nutrients are abundant and the pH is usually neutral leading to an abundance of plant and animal life. Marshes recharge groundwater supplies and moderate stream flow by providing water to streams. This is an, an especially important function during periods of drought. Marsh vegetation and microorganisms also use excess nutrients for growth that can otherwise pollute surface water, such as nitrogen and phosphorus from fertilizer. This wetland type is very important to preserving the quality of surface water. An example of marsh in the Philippines is the Agusan Marsh. This marsh is semi-permanent lake where thousands of hectares of lily pads, hyacinths, and other hydrophytic plants are present. Many animals live in this area like the catfish, carp, soft-shell freshwater turtles, and crocodiles. Forested wetlands are commonly called swamps since they are dominated by trees. Swamps are characterized by saturated soils during the growing season and standing water during certain times of the year. The highly organic soils of swamps form a thick, black, nutrient-rich environment for the growth of water-tolerant trees such as cypress, Atlantic white cedar, swamp oaks, and tupelo. Some swamps are dominated by shrubs such as button bush or smooth alder. Swamps serve vital roles in flood protection and nutrient removal. Many upland creatures depend on the abundance of food found in the lowland swamps and valuable timber can be sustainably harvested to provide building materials for people. In the Philippines, one major swamp is the Candaba Swamp, found in Pampanga. The entire area is usually flooded in the wet season, but most of it dries out during the dry season, late November to April. This swamp is mainly converted as a rice field and watermelon plantation. Migratory birds also visit the Candaba Swamp. Wetlands that are characterized by accumulation of decayed organic matter are called mires or pitlands. Pit is partly decomposed compressed organic material such as reeds and sedges and it holds up to 10 times more water than other wetland soils. There are mainly two types of mires. Fens are peat-forming wetlands that receive nutrients from sources other than precipitation, usually from upslope sources through drainage, from surrounding mineral soils, and from groundwater movement. Fens differ from bogs because they are less acidic and have higher nutrient levels. They are therefore able to support a much more diverse plant and animal community. 
These systems are often covered by grasses, sedges, rushes, and wildflowers. On the other hand, bogs is a type of wetland ecosystem characterized by wet, spongy, poorly drained peaty soil, dominated by the growth of bog mosses, sphagnum, and heats, particularly the Kama Daphne. Bogs are usually acid areas frequently surrounding a body of open water. Bogs receive water exclusively from rainfall. Formation, persistence, size, and function of wetlands are controlled by hydrologic processes. Distribution and differences in wetland type, vegetative composition, and soil type are caused primarily by geology, topography, and climate. Differences also are the product of the movement of water through or within the wetland, water quality, and the degree of natural or human-induced disturbance. In turn, the wetland soils are, and vegetation alter water velocity, flow paths, and chemistry. The hydrologic and water quality functions of wetlands, that is, the roles of wetlands, play in changing the quantity or quality of water moving through them are related to the wetlands physical setting. Hydrologic processes occurring in wetlands are the same processes that occur outside of wetlands and collectively are referred to as the hydrologic cycle. Major components of the hydrologic cycle are precipitation, surface water flow, groundwater flow, and evapotranspiration. Wetlands and uplands continually receive or lose water through exchange with the atmosphere, streams, and groundwater, both a favorable geologic setting and an advocate and persistent supply of water are necessary for the existence of wetlands. Isolated basin wetlands, typified by prairie potholes and playa lakes, receive direct precipitation and some runoff from surrounding uplands, and sometimes receive groundwater inflow. They lose water to evapotranspiration, some lose water that seeps to groundwater, and some overflow during periods of excessive precipitation and runoff. These wetlands range from very wet to dry depending on seasonal and long-term climatic cycles. Wetlands on lake or river flood plains also receive direct precipitation and runoff and commonly receive groundwater inflow. In addition, they can be flooded when lakes or rivers are high. Water drains back to the lake or river as flood waters recede. Wet and dry cycles in these wetlands commonly are closely related to lake and river water level fluctuation. Coastal wetlands, while also receiving direct precipitation, runoff, and groundwater inflow, are strongly influenced by tidal cycles. Peatlands with raised centers may receive only direct precipitation or may be affected by groundwater inflow also. Surface water inflows affect only the edges of these wetlands. Biologically, freshwater wetlands are among the richest and most interesting ecosystems. They support a diverse array of invertebrates like crustaceans and insects. These invertebrates serve as food for waterfowl, herons, gulls, and other birds. Amphibians and reptiles like frogs, toads, and turtles inhabit emergent growth, soft mud, and the open water of marshes and swamps. There are many herbivores present too, such as the muskrat of prairie marshes. The dominant carnivore of marshes is the mink, which prey on the muskrat. Other predators like the raccoon, fox, weasel, and skunk prey on waterfowls on small marshes.